Hello everybody, welcome to the show. I'm here today with Joshua Denny again, and we're going to today talk about the Keshe Jam body. And I was going to start with a little paragraph from Views from the Real World. If C could develop and pass into dough of a new octave, it would be possible to build a new body within us. This needs special conditions. Man by himself cannot become a new man. Special inner combinations are necessary. When such a special matter accumulates in sufficient quantities, it may begin to crystallize, as salt begins to crystallize in water. If more than a certain proportion of it is added, what a great deal of fine matter accumulates in a man. There comes a moment when a new body can form and crystallize in him, the dough of a new octave, a higher octave. This body, often called the astral, can only be formed from this special matter and cannot come into being unconsciously. In ordinary conditions, this matter may be produced in the organism, but is used and thrown out. To build this body is the aim of all religions and all schools. Every religion has its own special way, but the aim is always the same. So we're talking about the astral Kestrian body there, aren't we? And it's quite a, um, a lot of work to get, well, first to understand what it is, <laughs> And then to actually work on it. So maybe, Joshua, where would you like to start with that? <laughs> well, I suppose just like maybe start with a rough, you know, introduction to the Kestian body or the astral, astral body, like, you know, in Gurdjieff's terms and the terms of the work. So like throughout Gurdjieff's kind of like teaching period and in his books, he does often kind of use different terminology. Like, you know, sometimes he refers to like different numbers of bodies that man has or different numbers of centers or different names, you know. So like say in Beelzebub's tales, he, you know, he, he refers to kind of like three bodies. So there's like what he calls a planetary body. So that would probably suggest like your physical body. And he also refers to like a second body, which he kind of calls in Beelzebub the Kestian body. And again, we've talked a little bit about it. So I think the term Kestian has kind of connotations of spirit vessel. So like a vessel, like a container of spirit, or, or sometimes instead of spirit, there's a kind of a soul you know because again different traditions have can sometimes flip the their use of spirit and soul so sometimes they use it in the same way those two terms and sometimes they use the terms to refer to different things so yeah the kind of in the name Kesdjian it suggests like say spirit vessel or maybe soul vessel and that's like his second body and then in Beelzebub he refers to what he call, I think he calls the highest being body maybe even just the higher being body and I think that's kind of like the soul, you know, what you would call them, the soul, like the being body of the soul. So in Beelzebub, he kind of refers to three bodies, uh, whereas like in, in Search of the Miraculous, I think he tends to like talk of four bodies and like his terminology in, in Search of the Miraculous is a bit more kind of um, uh, related to or uses some of the same terms as like theosophy and stuff, doesn't it? Like like he talks of like a ca um, causal body and stuff like that, an astral and body. The every and body. Yeah, so he uses some more similar terms in, this, in, in Search of Miraculous uh, to like theosophy and stuff. So like again, in, compa in like comparing those kind of two terms, I would suggest that like what he calls the Kestian body in Beelzebub would probably be like a combination of kind of the astral and mental bodies in the terms of like theosophy or like the terms of Steiner. So I think it would refer to like a combination of those, the, the astral and the mental and like Again, people ask the, could ask the question, why like, does he refer to different numbers of bodies? Or like, why does he sometimes say like man has four bodies or you know, three bodies? Or sometimes he says man has like three centers or sometimes he says like seven centers. You know? So, and people can think that, you know, can try to like reconcile, you know, those two different um, like terminologies and try to like, you know, uh, make them fit together. Whereas maybe they're just like, they're different presentations for a reason you know they kind of look at man for from different angles so it's like saying in one sense yeah man does have seven bodies but in another sense he has three it just maybe depends what you, the way that you're looking at man or how you're kind of defining your body i find so, it e I, i'm just going to jump in there in egypt they talk about the seven bodies um and i can't remember the name for them all the sar the bar the car and there's another four and you know i sometimes find gurdjieff's work seems to be very egyptian related um, mm -hmm. So I wonder if he's getting that from there. Perhaps he's learned from the ancient well, Egyptians. 
Well, I think like seven and three, you know, he talks about the law of seven and the law of three. So they're like, you know, his like favorite numbers, you could say seven. So it, w- it would make sense that he would have like present man as having in one sense, seven bodies and also like three, you know. So I think he, he I think in a way, in Bielsa will be uses three bodies, maybe to try to be a bit of a simplification, you know, let's reduce seven bodies just down to three. And because maybe, you know, even though man could have seven bodies, those different bodies could have more or less in common with each other, you know. So I think he tries to reduce things, yeah, to three to make it a bit more simple. And also, he is a kind of a Christian, you could say, like, you know, in his upbringing and stuff. So the triad, the Trinity, threeness, you know, it would make sense for that to, you know, play a part in his, you know, his ideas and his teaching. And so the sense of three bodies also kind of corresponds to that idea of like three worlds or three domains. Again, a lot of different teachings can have that idea that there's like three realms and, you know, one set of terms for that could be like body, soul and spirit. So again, like this idea that man is, you know, in himself, he's not just like made of one kind of nature. So like, it's not just like a homogenous, you know, and so he has different natures, multiple natures. And also then because he has multiple natures, he kind of participates or is like made of multiple worlds, you know, that actually have different natures. So again, that in the, you know, the fourth way teaching, like in, in Search for Miraculous, I think there's a chapter somewhere about cosmoses. And he kind of says that knowledge, like the teaching of the fourth way, you could say, and stuff begins with this idea of cosmoses. So trying to get an appreciation uh, that they're, like cosmos, you could say, could be another name for world or domain. So trying to get an appreciation that there are actually reality, then the universe, whatever your experience is composed of really different domains that are actually different, although they're related, they are actually really different realms. So like just taken simply, you could look at your own experience in terms of like your mind and your feelings and your body, like these three aspects like the present in my experience. And though obviously at one level, my experience is a whole, um, those different aspects of thought and feeling and sensation do appear and are experienced to be really different. Though there are there is some sameness to them, there is some real difference. So when he talks about the Kesdjian body, or the let's say the astral body, then I suppose oh, obviously I suppose we should say something about the astral. Astral doesn't it kind of refers to the stars, like the, you know it's kind of like star stella in the word astral. So I suppose traditionally. The realm of the stars is like you know the the starry heavens, you know the the heaven the firm you know, um, so it doesn't really and although it has star in the name and stars are like to mean suns, it doesn't really refer to the solar level. It refers to more like the level of the planets. So obviously the starry night sky that you're looking at, although you can see sometimes other you know other galaxies. Really, what you're looking at is the immediate solar system. So it kind of refers to the realm that's under the law of the sun, you know, under the influence of the sun. So, yeah, I'll just say the astral then kind of traditionally relates to the world of the planets. And I suppose in the fourth way, there's this idea again that the different worlds um, and different bodies then have different laws. Again, they have a different nature. So that's like in, in a different world, if it's got a different nature, then different laws, you know, different laws apply. It's just like in the physical world, like solids, you could say, are under different laws than liquids, if you like, or gases, in the sense that they behave differently. You know, different things are possible for a liquid than a solid than a gas. So you could say the laws in this sense refer to kind of like differences in nature and behavior and possibility, what, you know, what's possible in, in this or that realm. So then with the Kesdjian body referring to sort of the, the realm of the planets, there's the idea that it's under fewer laws. So again, there's this idea that the higher you go, the higher the realm, the fewer laws it's under. So you could say the more, you could say the more possibilities it, it has. Although, in a sense, like each level has some offers something unique. You know, so it's not just a case that in one sense the higher is completely inclusive of the of the lower. You know, it's um, like certain things are possible on Earth that aren't possible then in the in the Kesdjian realm or in the planetary realm, even though in a relative sense, the, there's more things possible in the Kesdjian realm. If, do you see what I mean? Isn't that also to do with uh, law of accident? As you go higher up, the law of accident goes down. So that can happen on this earth, and then you'll start going to the law of uh, karma. 
Yeah, well, like, yeah, he, he speaks of three kind of main realms of law that people can be under, like accident, fate, and will. So, yeah, that, that ties in. But I'm just saying that if you imagine just like, yeah, that in the Kesdjian realm or the astral realm, whatever you, would, whatever you imagine that to be, yeah, certain things are possible in that realm because of the nature of that sort of um, environment. You know, it's like saying space is a different environment to on Earth. Like it, there isn't as much gravity then. So different, different things are possible there. You know, experience is different because of the nature of that environment. So on the terrestrial uh, planetary environment, there are certain limits, but there are also certain things that are possible because of its nature. You know, so the Earth has a, offers something unique that's not possible in, in space, if we use space here to mean like, you know, the astral realm. But in a, in a more kind of relative sense, obviously, yeah, there is a, you could say, a progression that more things are possible in the higher, the higher realm. But just this idea that, yes, each level provides something unique. So this so anyway, Earth yeah. that we're on, this is the place where we can develop the Kesjian body. That's yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So like you said, the development involves the, the interaction of all those different, um, you know, those different levels together. And yeah, we need a, we can't develop like a Kesjian body then without a physical body. Yeah, so exactly the same thing. Each, each level offers something, although relatively the higher level is under less laws and you could say that more things are possible in, in the higher realm. So when he talks about the, like Kesjian body and the astral body, he does like use, he links it with them, Air, like again, Gurdjieff talks about man as having like three forms of food. And the first one being physical food, and then the second food being like new air and breathing, and the third food being like your impressions. So he kind of seems to suggest that the second um, food, air, then is, um, you know, specifically related to the development of the Kesian body, you could say, or like what feeds it. Although obviously the as you're saying, the planetary body, the physical food, and also the food of impressions, they all, you know, they all, um, they're all involved in that process. So, yeah, he kind of suggests that, that in air, there are these like higher elements, you could say higher substances, or even just say possibilities. The fact that we are breathing creatures gives us certain possibilities. And obviously, particularly man, the fact that not only are we a breathing creature, but we are a creature with a certain degree of consciousness or the possibility for that. So we can be aware of our breath in a different way to like animals than, you know, one brained and two brained beings. So the fact that we can be aware of our breath gives us certain possibilities. It's like he says, there is this possibility for a higher substance than to be assimilated uh, from the air. And obviously, again, there's loads of ideas in different traditions about breathing practices, you know, meditations involving the breath, either being like, aware of it or you know altering it in some form or another and it's kind of known in most esoteric traditions that you can do um certain practices you know intentional practices with the breath and it will enable you to do certain things like it can be used to initiate certain physical capacities like um i suppose a, a more modern example now would be this there's this guy called wim hof wim hof he's like a dutch guy and it's, he's been he's demonstrated not just himself but on other people in like you know scientific conditions that through breathing practices you can um, interface with your auto um autonomic or whatever you call it nervous system you know the part of the nervous system that's supposed to be like outside of your intentional control and that was you know obviously there's that controls all sorts of functions but he's demonstrated it in with immune response so like you can inject normally if you inject somebody with like a virus or something, obviously automatically that triggers like the, you know, the immune response and that can give like fever or whatever symptoms. And normally there's no sense that we're supposed to be able to con interface with that reaction, our immune system consciously or intentionally, but they've kind of demonstrated that you can through these techniques, you can say at will that um, fever response so that your body, and he's done other things like, you know, it's, spending time in the cold and things like that so it's known that through certain breathing techniques you can access a different level of intentionality in your body you know you can find a way to yeah intentionally access systems that you're not normally able to do so and because of that you can get certain higher capacities out of it that can seem like super you know superman capacities like super strength or agility or like being able to hold your breath for much longer you know so i'm just saying that it's kind of known in most of the traditions that it's coming now more into mainstream science that there is um yeah there are certain higher 
potentials there that we can access through meditational and techniques and often ones that particularly involve the breathing. I've always so, found it interesting, Alexander David Neal. Have you ever read her books, Alexander David Neal? She went out to Tibet in the 1800s, dressed up as a man and lived with the Tibetan monks. And she used to say about how they'd go running or jumping, hopping across the plateau, you know, which to us would take hours to walk, but they'd just run across a bit. She said it was how they developed themselves before they went in their breathing meditation. Or if they were yeah. in a cold area, they'd breathe in, and ignite themselves inside with fire, you know, not real fire, obviously, but they're telling <laughs> they're breathing yeah. and they set the yeah. fire off in their solar plexus and spread it around their body so that they stay warm. And that was all breathing technique, she was saying. Yeah, yeah. So, like, he speaks, he speaks of the Kestrian body, the astral body, then saying, like, one of its main foods is air and that there, is, there are higher potentials in air that we can, you know, access. So it's like saying, yeah, more conscious interaction with uh, with breath, with air, whether that's in the form of like, you know, some intentional practice or even just like just trying to be more aware of it, that that can will cause changes. Like there could be more obvious changes, like things like that, or maybe even subtly, like just over time through having more awareness of my breath, like maybe not, you know, messing around with it necessarily doing in intense practices, but even just being more aware of it daily, that that, like he talks about something, you know, being deposited in you over time so yeah he doesn't tend to advocate um Gurdjieff like very many like meditations with the breath in terms of like altering it but he does um although he did give um breathing exercises to people like different people mentioned it the Fontainebleau that he did they did practice you know altering the breath but, but it, there were specific exercises for that person yeah. weren't they which is why I think a lot of his exercises are not meant to be for everybody well, there were some that they, he gave to like everybody, like they, they did in the group together, and there was other ones that that they were you know given individually. But I'm just saying that he, 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 in one sense, he warned against it in a jet as like a general warning, saying, "Well, be careful, you know, if you're engaging in altering the breath, because obviously that could you could mess around with something that um, you're not supposed to in a negative way, and obviously you could, could cause yourself problems, you know, like stop your breathing and stuff." So he does like give a, a quite stern, you know, warning on that and says the best thing like is to do nothing. You know, if you don't, you know, if you don't know what you're doing or like if you, if you don't really know or, you know, you'd have to speak about trust, wouldn't you? If you, if you were giving exercises from somebody, you know, else who you thought was a master, then obviously you'd be like taking it on faith that the exercises that they were giving you weren't good. You know, you'd have to make that decision yourself. So I'm just saying he does warn against it. Almost says don't do anything, you know, unless you know what you're doing or you, you know, you think you were the master. Because it could, you know, but he does it. He does advocate being aware of your breath, like just in a passive way. And so he gave he, most a lot of the exercises of the work involve like they do involve intentional attention a lot of the time to your body, but on dividing your attention. And usually one of the aspects of the inner exercises will involve an awareness of the breath either just like generally as part of your whole body or like specifically like dividing your attention to part of your breath and maybe part of your attention or something else. So a lot of the inner work exercises in the fourth way do involve your breath in some way, you know, so they are, you could say breathing exercises, but they're not intentionally, you know, altering the, the breath. But um, some of the, you know, like Bennett, JG Bennett, who was a pupil of um, Gurdjieff, um, he did, he did bring some, um, breathing exercises that I think he got some maybe he developed himself and some he found from like Sufism and stuff and you know he again talked about that thing about you know obviously it's a dangerous kind of area to get into but um, he does say that artificial altering of the breath there are techniques out there that aren't um, dangerous and can be you know useful for your development like developing your case your body so I'm just saying in the work, there are some breath, you know, breathing exercises and he did use some, you know, altering of artificial altering of the breath, but most of them are just passive. So yeah, he says that the breathing is like the, the main food of the case of your body. And um, I suppose the other main aspect of the case of body or how it's like developed is the set like sexual substance, doesn't it? He? he kind of talks about the sexual seed um, being the seed of like the, the Kestrian body is like, you know, he says that instead of the, 
sexual seed giving birth to a child or manifesting, you know, externally, it can manifest internally in a new, like a new form of being, a new life or this like new body. Which but again, I've never quite understood how you do. Um, and I've had many people say very weird ways of how you would do that. Um, <laughs> I <laughs> yeah, bet. Yeah. Obviously, looking at people like Crowley and that, they used to say the seed was sacred and would be, he'd like to have a Tommy Tank all the time and be donating that to the gods, but not <laughs> to himself to develop his higher self. But he wasn't just going on about Crowley for a moment. He wasn't looking to develop his higher self. He was looking to contact his higher self. He saw it as a different thing, that it was already out there to contact where what Gurdjieff's saying here of the case jam body, I believe, is we've got to develop this case jam body, which is what you're saying. These are the ways to do it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm just saying that. So on one hand, a big player in this second body is air in some form, like some digestion of air or some changing our relation to air in some way. That's like one part of it, big part of it. And then the other big player that he seems to suggest is, um, or one of the big players is this, like the sexual substance or the sexual, you know, the sexual center, the sexual potential. Now, obviously the sex center isn't just limited to like the physical act of sex because it, you know, the, the what is the essence of sex is kind of like creativity, creation, like, you know, a form of creation anyway, giving birth to a new life. So it's a one form of creativity, but, so you could link that with just the essence of creativity. So like you could look at art, the sexual center can express in a creativity in art. It could express in sport. It could express in, you know, and like it kind of suggests that, yeah, obviously the sexual energy can ma ma manifest in a negative way or we can use it in a negative way, not in its appropriate way, where he kind of says that it manifested a kind of, um, what do you say, like a, a, a kind of in, in an intensity, like a heightened intensity of activity in some domain, like maybe if you're the sexual energy manifested in, like if you're a sportsman, maybe you get really amped up, like before a game and you maybe really aggressive. Or, and if you lose, you're like, you know, you smash up your, your, you know, your dressing room or something like that. Or maybe it can just make you really heightened concentration or really productive, like you're a painter and you're just like, you know, churning out loads of material. So it plays a role in creativity, it, like in all the different ways that creativity can express. And also, but of course that can manifest in a negative way like but there is a positive um yeah there is a positive kind of sexual element to creativity like any you know but obviously that doesn't mean that has like when we say sexual we just mean at the level of creativity there's not doesn't have to be any sexual kind of thoughts or feelings or sensations involved in the activity of the sex center so i'm just saying the sex center goes beyond what we know as sex as the physical act and sex in terms of sexual thoughts and sexual feelings or sensations yeah just like it's to do with creativity and also that it's often linked in some of the diagrams it's like the sex center obviously it's placed at the lower you know the sexual area but it's often connected with will so again will can be like a creative force you know a kind of a power and also can become a kind of individual power like each each woman each man has a has a sexual potential a, a, a potential for it, creativity to some degree so it's like you have an individual it's your individual access to creativity or the individual form of creativity of, of course that's different to like you know the creativity of god but it's still a one form of creativity so again there's all sorts of ideas about how you can interact with your sex center then like you know yourself all these ideas about manipulations with the, the sexual act but i would say all most of those ideas again they're limiting the sexual seed the potential to just the physical act of sex rather than this more general sense of just creativity you could say you know, in some area or creativity as you were saying is linked to the will isn't it your willpower is hopefully you're creating something with it so you want to direct that energy through your will <laughs> yeah and like both i suppose both air and um sex then or have a particular connection with your body they're very like you know they're very tangible in a way very somatic you know like breath you know breath is one of the main like if you just if you draw some attention to your your body then your physical presence breath is one of the main things that will be you know in your awareness so it's, it's a big um 
it's a big stimulus, you know, like that process of breath going in and out. It's a lot of nerves and things are being constantly stimulated by the breathing process. So it's like one of our main means of connection with our body, you know, regardless of whether we're being conscious of our breath or not. The fact that breath is going on is one kind of means you could say like, of almost anchoring, uh, you know, our attention to the body to some degree. I mean, obviously, like in a more general sense, the breath is like the means of anchoring the life force to the body or the soul to the body. You know, like there's that idea like, oh, when you sneeze, you say bless yourself because the soul might come out, you know, because the soul is like seen as something that's like constantly flowing, you could say into and out of the body or like through this, the breath, the fact that the breath is coming in and out. It's like maintaining, giving the soul access to the body. You know, keeping That's the soul. Right. I never knew that about the sneeze. I always thought you had. I was always told you say bless you because when you sneeze, you're sneezing the devil out. <laughs> well, it, I it, like it, what it, you it, say better. <laughs> well, it goes both. It goes both ways. Like, yeah, obviously, sneezing and stuff can be like connected with the illnesses. You know, it can be one sign. So, like that could be like obviously illness in some in previous times has been like get it could be like the action of a devil. So, like you, sneezing can be caused by a devil or can be like. The, the devil coming back coming out of you like you know your body trying to expel the devil but yeah it's still in a way even with it link, be, being linked to the devil and sickness what get the sickness is more related to the soul like when these teachings talk about sicknesses they usually say it's at the level of the soul and then that can express in the body you know so there's still there's still that connection between the breath and um the kind of soul then in both those senses like of sneezing to keep the soul in and also like the devil coming out or whatever to protect it <laughs> So anyway, so yeah, I just want to say the breath, that's like one big player in connecting to our physical body, or you could say it's one main player in connecting our like mind or attention or our consciousness to our body. I mean, it's an obvious, it's an obvious thing in a way, isn't it? That obviously if I, if my, if my breathing is altered, like if my breath slows down at some point, I'll pass out. So there's an obvious literal kind of physical connection there between like breath and your consciousness that depending on what state your breath is in will determine what state your consciousness is in you know so it does suggest that yeah a higher state of consciousness there'll be a difference in your breathing you know that doesn't necessarily mean that there'll be a, a physical difference like that maybe in the rate it could be like maybe it'll be faster or slower there could be some physical change to it but more that your experience your, ex, your experience of it will change you know you how you're how you're aware of your breath like where you are in relation to it or the actual somatic experience of the breath can change like again it's known from a lot of the meditations and stuff that even if even if you're not doing anything with your breath maybe you're just like sitting down trying to clear your mind or maybe just being like one pointedly focused lots of people will notice that the breath will change like generally over time the more kind of relaxed you become or the more focused you become the breath will become slower and can almost like come to a stop like people can sometimes freak out in long meditations because like the breath can appear literally can't stop and stop for a long time, you know, a long time. And also like a lot of Zen and like Taoist meditations and stuff, they, you know, again, they'd be aware of the breath and you can get to that point where like the, the inhale and the exhale kind of become one. Like you get to a point where you can't tell the difference between the inhale and the exhale. So it just becomes one movement instead of like two movements. So here there's a kind of a link they say let's say then between the breath becoming unified say into one movement and like our emotions and our thinking kind of becoming more unified like not being so limited to dualistic thinking or like this constant um division and alternation in our emotions between like pleasant and unpleasant or you know like and dislike you know. so i was gonna say okay. it just reminds me of um the late great vivian stan Shaw of the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band, he said that all crime is down to incorrect breathing. Brilliant. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, well, well, there you go. That's it. it you know, it, you know, I agree. Like, it's obviously even all these ideas, like these, te like the more esoteric ones, they all still filter down to like common sense and, and um, common knowledge. Like everybody, like, take a breath. As, you know, if somebody's like getting, you know, riled up, we just say take a breath. So it's even known at a, at, at a basic level that the breath can influence your emotions. So we know these things, but we don't kind of explore the full potential of that, the full implications of that in, like, in our daily life. You know, it's like I wait till I get angry to maybe then for someone to say like, take a breath and I go, okay, then I, 
and maybe then I calm down, you know. So I, 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 I don't use like a general awareness of, of, of breath, you know, to stop myself from getting into that position. You see what I mean? We don't make use of these kind of the knowledge that's already, we kind of know at a kind of, you know, cultural level, you know. Because we see it in other people, don't we? Like, you know, you see someone getting all fretted and angry and going, or starting to cry. <laughs> But it's when we see it, it's trying to observe it in ourselves, but it's really difficult when them emotions have taken you over. But if we can start seeing it in ourselves and realise, you know, as we're getting frustrated and our breathing's going crazy and our heart's beating, if we can just, like you say, take the breath. Yeah. Slow it all down. Yeah. So, yeah. And like we were saying, these, the, like a lot of the practices of the work and of the traditions, they, you know, they're focused on some, a greater awareness of your body, you know. And like saying breath is a big player in that. If I'm aware of my body, then I'll be aware of my breath or I can try to use my awareness of my breath to embody. And like the, having some more awareness of my body, like kind of being more aware of my somatic, you know, the physical experience of the body, then yeah, that can obviously will have some effect on my state just because I'm doing something different. It's going to have some effect, but also it can make me, like you say, more, aware earlier of any like rufflings that could become outbursts or, or you know or also it's just known as well that being aware of the breath it naturally has a, some a kind of a positive emotion with it you know that's why it, you could say it can, it can calm you down because it has some positive antidote to the negative you know there is a positive aspect there so if you're aware of the breath yeah it can make you less likely to outburst but it could also maybe just make you in a positive state you know where of course yeah you'd be less likely to to have any negative reaction because you're not in a negative um state you're not if you you know if you're in a more positive state then you're less susceptible to any kind of negativity aren't you? so again with his idea that the breath is like food for the second body uh he also i think makes a connection with it being like a food for the emotions you could say because this like question body the second body i think he does kind of say that it's the only it's kind of it's only possible to have like true positive emotions with this second body like without it we're just in that position where the emotions are divided you know like polar so what, what what our experience of positive is always you know the positive that's relative to the negative rather than that you could say the true positive is like when the when the dual aspects are united or reconciled you know that there can be a true positive emotion but well, we have so, to develop that case jam body first don't we in this life and i was just reading here or reading earlier, that to do this, this, this the case jam body is created by sacred substances, abrastonis and helkdonis. And this is all done through the, I don't like this word, fuller uh, nitarminian process. Yeah, <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> because all the time, um, while we're living on this planet, our body is struggling against doing this. And this is what's so frustrating. We want to make our case jam bodies, but living on this planet, we get caught up with our lower self because the case jam body in a way is a development to your higher. So our body and our mind and our emotions are, are struggling and trying to live in this life rather than looking forward to making a lovely case jam body to live in when we're gone <laughs> from this body, from this earth. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's like, you know, yeah, I mean, he does say that the case of your body has a particular role to play for like when you die, like if you've got a case of your body, if after life or fate will be different. But obviously, like he said, it's something that could be developed in life. Like you don't have to wait till, till you're dead to access it. But, well, don't we see, um, I thought we had to build it in this life. And then when we died, it was then ready for us. So we can still use our, if we develop it, of course, we could use our case gen body in this earth while we live in. Like if I developed it, I could be using it in this life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I would say really, you know, that my own experience on it, I would say that it, it everybody has one in a way, a case your body. Like in, in, um, in, life is real only then when I am. I think he says, doesn't he, that every man has two worlds, you know, like an inner world and an outer world. And I would say that the case your body pertains to the, the inner world, right? Like the second of those two worlds that every man has. So you could say that everybody has a case your body in a way that everybody has an inner world. So it's like everybody has some, you know, think of it as a material then, whatever that inner world is made of. Say it's a different material to the outer world, let's just say. Then it, then everybody has that material and that's the stuff that let say the case body can be formed from. So it's like different experiences can 
obviously like you know sometimes he talks about us having atmospheres like you know imagine that there's like an atmosphere around your head relating to your you know thinking center and then one around your heart relating to your feeling center and then one just generally around your body you know your body center you know so every experience causes like fluctuations in that atmosphere you know if, you know it can maybe change its shape or change the kind of activity that's going on it you know change its color let's say then you know imagine it's like a chemical reaction the experiences different the different experiences are like different chemicals and they react differently with the chemicals that this atmosphere is made of so it's changing shape or its nature all the time being stimulated in different ways and maybe in cer certain what we take to be like higher states or more positive experiences that inner atmosphere takes a kind of a certain shape or maybe becomes a bit more substantial in its nature you know or maybe if you imagined it of being a mix of different colors it's like it briefly comes into a kind of a spectrum like a rainbow so like in higher states it's like you're in a world of coherence substantiality comes into a bit more of appropriate order and that's like a temporary kind of like almost taking shape of the Christian body i would say so it's like we all have a Christian body in the sense that we have the stuff that it's made from so you could say we all have a Christian body but just in different like states of development like some teachings talk about that second body is like being in us in an embryo state you know like like the same way that the you know a woman can, has the baby you know it's like um so like when the embryo is formed like the organs are in a different place aren't they like in the physical baby and stuff they like in the heart like i think the heart's like on the head and it drops down over the course of the baby's like you know gestation so they say that this second body is like in us in a kind of a similar way. It's like the embryo. So we've got these different organs that this second body is made from, but they, they're all like kind of diffuse. They're not in the right, they're not connected. You know, the embryo is not formed yet and they have to come together and be formed. But I'm just saying that, so in one sense, we've all got it, but it, it's not the full body, you know, so that's like, a, yeah, a transformation that can take place. Okay, and, does that make sense of something that I was reading also that, um, well, where is it? So this is from All and Everything, page 764. Uh, have I got the right one? Let me just check, sorry, I had it written down. Why Kesh Jam was being formed. Do, do, do. Oh, sorry, I'm mucking this about now. I had it all there and now I've lost it. So right. from such cosmic results, exactly similar forms began to be coated in their common presences, at first from the substances transformed by the sun and by other planets of that solar system. So he does say that they had the similar, yeah, you have got the similar form in you, like you say, like an embryo then. Yeah, I'm just saying that we've all got the, yeah, like, okay. let's, we, could, we could just say you've all got, you've all, everybody's got the stuff that the Kesha body's made from because it corresponds to the inner world, what he calls the inner world. And that stuff that it's made from is constantly, sh like, becoming more solid and less solid like it's fluctuating all the time and when it becomes more solid that's like it becomes more like the Kesian body do you see what i mean or act, like operates so uh, like there's some transformation can happen like he talks about the powders in the retort like there's, there's like a, a vessel it's got these different powders in them they're constantly like moving around they're not fused together or stationary you know in their respective places so that's like that transformation can happen that inner the stuff of that inner world can some transformation can happen where it can kind of fuse so it's not so much uh, you know in flux at the whim of whatever's going on around you and that transformation that more coherence like stability brings certain higher capacities like he says this this case your body has its organs of perception like its senses just as the physical body does it has its own means of experience you know so in one sense it's like an analog of the physical body but obviously it has a different nature it's not physical in its nature it's more like um you know it's more related to what we would call our dream body you know again dreams are connected to the realm of the planets you know and they're an experience of the inner world you know when we enter the dream world we leave the physical world the outer world you know so again like dream experiences and like experiences of like trance states and like outer body experiences astral travel you could say that they're all to some extent manifestations of the case body like somebody might just be born with 
their inner world in a, maybe a greater state of sub, you know coherence, or maybe just with a a bit of a talent in some particular area, just like people can be born with physical talents. So and so maybe that gives them like a natural capacity to astral travel or something like that. And you could say that that yeah, that's like a a, a capacity of the Keshian body. You know, like it's maybe something that one of its organs can do. You know. So in that sense, everybody, we all, we all deal with the Keshian body or the astral realm all the time. It's part of this uh, inner world. It's part of our experience, just as we're all dealing with the, you know, the physical world. Like he says, we all live in two worlds, but the common man isn't really as aware of his inner world as he is as, of his outer world. We're more like focused on the senses. That's where our attention is more kind of, um, yeah. It's but our, our task attention. is to work on that Keshian body. That should yeah. be our aim. Well, yeah, like um, you could think of the Keshian body as, as developing some more kind of like stability to your inner world. Like most of us, I suppose, if we try to be honest with ourselves and like, you know, observe our inner world, it, most of the time it's, it's not very, um, you could say focused but, uh, or ordered. Like, and it's at the mercy of what's going on. Like sometimes, you know, you might be, lost in a daydream and come back to yourself and then remember what you you were doing so you know it's it's very dream-like i would say our inner world in general there isn't like it doesn't have much stability to it and we don't have much um, intentional capacities like most people report when they first start trying to like direct their minds or engage with their minds in some more intentional way that you meet a lot of resistance you know so we're not we don't seem to be given much like automatic um capacities in regard to our inner world it's like we have to come to develop them you know and that's like what a lot of this work about the inner body is it's like developing your your presence in your own inner world like what you're able to do your abilities in your inner world gaining some more capacity like over that so that's like you know that that refers to like your interactions with your body in terms of like sensation like again this idea that you can develop the sensation capacities that you're given so like even in just in sense of intentionality, as we're born, we're only given a certain number of muscles that we, nature has allowed us, you could say, given us intentional access to. If we want to, it's probably like 50 out of 200 or something is what we have access to. And if we want to get access to the others, we have to do some form of work, you know, an effort to try to, you know, to gain access to control those muscles, which we can, like certain athletes and stuff can gain access to more through their, you know, years of work. Again, it's like we're only given certain capacities and we have potential for more, but there has to be some work done to, you know, to, to realize that potential. And unless people kind of know about that, that there is this potential to gain more access, then it's, um, it's, un it's unlikely that people in general will, you know, they'll, that they'll know about that or that they'll be bothered, maybe interested to do it, you know. So that inner world you're saying about, so my brain's just going off on a few things, but it's like, well, this is why we want to do positive thought. We don't want to be sitting there feeling sorry for ourselves or thinking, oh, that person's thinking this about me. We don't want any of that because that's going into our inner world. We need to have. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like he's, yeah, like not, obviously your inner world plays a big part in your own experience, you know, but like he says, we're all connected in some way. So yeah, whatever's going on on your inner world, like he he talks about in terms of substances, you know, like a negative emotion is a particular like kind of substance. Then, so if you've got negative thoughts going on, then you're like putting out that that vibration, that substance, whichever way you you know, and that has some effect. So yeah, the idea is trying to become more, not for just your own welfare, <laughs> become more, you know. I say in control of your states, but not so at mercy, you know, not so at mercy to the flux of surrounding conditions controlling your states. A kind of and awareness, uh, awareness of what you're doing. Because Steiner says when you're doing, you know, negative thoughts to someone, you're killing them. Um, yeah. And you're sending like, like little arrows of uh, horridness or whatever, you know. And I've always yeah. found it interesting that Anna Kingsford, who was a big theosophist in the 1880s or 1890s, she hated the vivisectionists and she used to, she writes about this, she used to send horrible she thoughts to kill them. She wanted them to die, these vivisectionists, for the work yeah. they did. And she died very young and they say her energy was drained from doing all this, sending horrible, you know, you must die thoughts to these yeah. vivisectionists. When instead really what she should have been was perhaps sending love to them and perhaps, 
you know, trying to get them to have wisdom or to open up to what they were doing, to think about them, to work on their conscience instead of, you know, I hate you for doing that to the little animals. You know, I understand. I don't like what they did to the little animals, but, you know, we mustn't be sending, you know, and we can do it in modern day, all these people that want to kill all the people that uh, are against whatever they believe in. It's just not right. We shouldn't think like that. We should try and send them sympathy and understanding thoughts or that they can somehow yeah. un open up to that. And love, of course, yeah. love is the most important. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, like talking of Steiner then, like, yeah, his idea is, I mean, it ties in with what we were saying earlier about the different worlds and levels of worlds and that the inner world is kind of more real, you could say then, to the outer world or that, you know, just if you were talking about levels, it would be at a higher level than the outer world, in which case you could say it has slightly more authority or it's just like it, it's, it's a big player in what happens in the external world, you know, like things come through, you could say come through the, the inner world, the mental world before they come into the, you know, physical world so obviously whatever's going on in the mental world will have physical repercussions is influence in the physical world and obviously it's obviously influence in your own mental world and other people's mental worlds like we say we interact with each other through our physical bodies and presences uh, you know our outer world we meet each other in the outer world but we're also at the same time meeting each other in the inner world you know these two which worlds. is very true he does say that the inner the inner world is the more important the real world and we're living in the reflection of it he steiner says that the astral body in the inner world is the real body and our physical body and our effort bodies are just reflections and they're here yeah. for whatever reasons he, he gives different reasons for that but he yeah he's saying we don't need to develop the astral body we're supposed to be developing these bodies our astral body is all perfect up in the astral world so that's I yeah find that slight difference with him and gurdjieff but there's still a kind of a connection to it all yeah, well, like we say, there can be slightly different, slight differences between like what he's referring to in terms of the astral body and like what Gurdjieff refers to as the second body. Like I said, maybe what Gurdjieff refers to as the Kestrian body is kind of like the astral and the mental body together, you know, in terms of like Steiner's, you know, Steiner's terms. Because um, Steiner also has the seven bodies, but I can't remember the names of them all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, and like, I think Steiner, like the second this um, the Kestrian body then, like we said, it has its own like organs, its own means of perception then. So and it also has like its own mind, you could say, its own kind of like thinking. It has and its so, own blood as well, doesn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, like um, yeah, he says that good if that you can like. Hamblidozon. Um, Hamblidozon, yeah. That's it. <laughs> he, that's what he got. Yeah, that's what he calls the blood of the second body, and he says that that um, that that second blood. You know, the, the analogy of the dry, the horse, the cart, and the driver, like man is this horse, cart, and driver. Well, like he says, the, the handle zone is the connection there between your mind and your emotions. You know, that's the means of a kind of an, or intentional connection or like fusion, you could say, between your mind and your emotions. And that, again, that fusion can refer to the, what we're talking about, this like, fusion of that inner, the stuff of the inner world. In terms of like the, 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 set, the three centers, like your mind, your feelings, and your body, it can refer to like a unification of your mind and your feelings like so like they work they work kind of come to work together whereas like most of the time they're working like uh, in opposite directions like we can be thinking something and feeling something else or like again our thoughts can be completely separated from our emotions and vice versa like not aware of each other so it can refer to some kind of fusion of them or where they unification where they come to work together and also like a, a literal change in your subjective experience of like thought and feeling they can like literally become more blended. Like again, there's this idea that our three main functions, thoughts, feelings, and sensations are like separated in an almost state. And we need to kind of blend them together so that they can come into a kind of higher form of unity. You know, like again, with the idea of these separate powders that need to like fuse together, you know. So yeah, it's literally like your, your thought, your feeling and your sensation can come to blend more into one function. You see what I mean? Instead of like having three kind of separate ones, it's like they blend together to form one. And I suppose like a physical analogy for that would be like, you know, that condition, is it synesthesia? You know, where like people's senses can become... They see mixed. colours and not see... They, yeah. Uh, smell well, sometimes... Colors. Yeah, it could be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, different ones can get blended. Yeah, different ones can get blended together, which is kind of like strange for us 
like us, they're normal people, to try to imagine what, <laughs> imagine what that would be like, you know. Like, imagine if you suddenly went from our, say, normal experience of the senses, where each of our senses is kind of like separate from the others, and obviously so, obviously so though they are related, but we can distinguish them apart. They're not kind of like blur, blurred together. So imagine if we suddenly were dropped into like the experience of a person who has had that synesthesia. Like that suddenly like you were tasting the colors say like you know every t- it would be quite disorientating and overwhelming if you were just like dropped into that experience you know so i would suggest that in some of our experience higher you know experiences that come to us it can be like that we, we're achieving a, a higher level of synthesis or blending between like our different senses but not our physical senses like our three senses of our thoughts feelings and like emotions you could say you know so again i think steiner talks about in a way like Steiner talks of this inner world as like the spirit world he calls it a lot of the time and again spirit has the connotation to this question body like the world of spirit or spirits and I think he Steiner talks about it as like almost a world of thought you know and requires um, the development of thought to kind of access you know or that that um, that that question body has a different kind of thinking you know to our no, you know our normal thinking and that, that can be, again, partially that thought is more blended with, like, our body and our feelings. So thought becomes, like, much more real, you could say. Um, you know, because sometimes our thinking can be more vivid. Like, use the example with dreaming. Sometimes people can have really vivid dreams, like, where everything is, like, hyper-real in the dream, like sensations or colours or whatever, the textures. And then they maybe have other dreams that are just norm, you know, a mirror of the physical world experience or even lesser, you know, more vague. So there, there can be that, um, you know, that difference in level, but there can be that hyper reality to sort of experiences of the question world. Then, like thought becomes much more vivid, you could say, or it's just much more invested with sensation and feeling. You know, I've got a question that's just suddenly popped in my head from what you were saying about that. Do you think other people can see other people's question bodies? You know, if they've got the sight to see it. Or do you think we can see our own case gen bodies? Or is it, it's, it's in us and around us, like you're saying, so we can't see it. What if I put my hand up and I had a case gen body? Would I see it around my hand? I think it, like, there's, again, there's problems here because, like you're saying, like, take the idea of, like, the seven bodies. In that one, or, like, there's the idea of, like, energy sheaths, you know. So one being within the other, like, Russian dolls. So there could be confusion around which, like, energy sheath it would be that you were seeing to begin with like you you know and i would suggest with the case body that well i suppose there's that idea that that the, the more inner or higher sheath that's developed that's going to have some influence on the lower sheaths or the more external sheaths if you like whichever way around you want to put that <laughs> so yeah you you could say that if you were a person who could see auras let's say then then you would probably suspect that someone who had a case body that, that would reflect in some difference in their aura, but that doesn't mean that the Cajun body is the aura. Do you see what I mean? So there can be differences to someone's aura or those other bodies if they've got a Cajun body, but that doesn't mean that the Cajun body is those bodies. Personally, I would say that the, the Cajun body can manifest in things like that, like w- that would be at the level of the etheric level in Steiner's things. It can manifest if it's there, it, if it's there to, to use those lower levels. But I, d- I wouldn't say it's of those lower levels. I would say it's it's using those lower levels. Okay, so it's not, to me. Sorry, to you. Well, to me, it's more. It's it. Like when people begin like um, work on their body and stuff, like doing these sensation exercises, you can come to start to feel a kind of a an atmosphere. Let's call it that a subtle something that sort of um, penetrates your physical body and um, is outside of it. You know, extends outside of it to a certain extent. So you can start to feel a kind of a subtle, subtle body, you know, a subtler body. It's made of kind of the same stuff as like your physical body sensation, kind of, but just more subtler at a finer level. It has a slightly different taste to it. So when you start I that I kind of work... I that because I was just thinking, is it Plato or Socrates? One of the Greek philosophers had his daemon. And I'm now wondering if that daemon was his case germ body talking to him. But I don't know the, man- the story enough to know... Was it somebody they saw and spoke to or, or, or was it a voice in their head? 
Oh, yeah, well, I mean, it, it, again, it, it could be it could be dependent again on the level that you are. Like, if you if you didn't have a Kesdjian body, then that wrestling with your daemon could be like that process of wrestling with your Kesdjian body. But if you had a higher body, then it could be that. I'd say, in essence, it probably refers to I, like real I, or like the seed of it. You know, we say we're born with the seed. So, like wrestling with like your 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 inner de- inner daemon, then would be like trying to encounter and engage this this capacity this seed of potential for real eye that has these higher powers then certain higher capacities but like we know by the nature we know that the nature of that process can be hazardous like it can be can, it can become distorted like Gurdjieff talks of the potential for wrong crystallization he says that lots of people can develop through different pro- practices Kesdjian bodies or astral bodies but they can be you know they, they, they can be crystallized in various different ways you know it's like the same process of physical birth like there could be all sorts of differences between babies physical bodies and their inner conditions it's not just one <laughs> guaranteed process where the say every every woman gives birth to the same you know the same baby so to speak. you know so even with the case of body there could be it can be coated it can be developed but there can be big variations as to its nature you know like there can be like distortions so like wrestling can refer to that you have to like you're wrestling t- to you know not crystallize it you could say in a negative way or the added aspect of temptation with higher capacities there's you know there's higher temptation there's more risk you could say because if you did crystallize it wrong you've got to destroy that body and then rebuild it again haven't you if you're aware well, he of said, what you've done well it says that you could get stuck or that yeah it's going to be some you're going to have to get some kind of help and that's going to involve like your suffering and that's like one you know one form of purgatory in Beelzebub's tales it's like every everybody's higher body has got something wrong with it. So at some, to some degree of something like impurity. And so it has to get, has to go to this place of purging, you know, so that it can go on to the, on to the source. So it's like, yes, yeah, like you say, we all have that, this, um, you know, this problem to deal with or this, but like you're saying, this potential for corruption that, that requires some higher help, you know, to be redeemed. Like, like, yeah, the Christian story is like, you know, the law was fine, but we weren't able to live up to the law. So something, a higher law had to, you know, had to come in. So yes, yeah, like we could do so much, but we still have to receive some kind of higher grace. You could call it that, something that can correct. You know? Oh, Salvador Dali says, perfection is impossible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, who's to say, uh, who's to say what is, is perfection? Who's to define that, you know? But yeah, with this idea of the Christian body, I would say it, there is obviously something similar between all Christian bodies because it's a Christian body, but there can still be um, differences. Like, because you you would say that really the higher bodies are more distinguished than the lower uh, lower bodies. Like, there would be more individuality that's possible in the in the higher bodies than there is in the lower ones. You know? Like, even in these physical bodies, it's lots of different kinds of faces and and lots of different kind of like characters. So you'd have to maybe imagine even more individuality or diversity. Uh, in in a higher body, you know. So again, like just this sense that the, the case of body, it's not just one same process for everyone. It doesn't just pan out the same way. There could be lots of variations, and maybe, like again, there's supposed to be some variations according to like your individuality. So maybe the case of body could manifest through different people in different ways. You know, again, the biblical idea about different talents. You know, so like maybe with some people it could manifest in a more like physical way that somebody else who had the eyes to see it could see it, but maybe with another person it wouldn't. I would say in general, the Keshav body is not equatable. Like I was talking about that, that kind of subtle body that can, you can come to kind of experience through like inner meditations. I was going to say that it's not strictly equatable to that. Like people can think when they start doing some of these inner practices and like in the work, there's like the preparation and some of those inner exercises where you can start to connect with what they call like an atmosphere or an inner atmosphere. And people can think that, oh, well, this must be the, you know, the second body. Whereas, again, just my opinion, I would say that that's more like at the level of um, what Steiner calls the etheric body. And that we need to do that. That, that can come into, a, you know, we can become more aware of that. And that can, t- again, take a more kind of solid shape in us. And then through that, we can connect to, like, um, the Kestrian body. But, again, I wouldn't say they're equatable. But the, I would say the Kestrian is of a more inner layer than that. It more For me, it's more like the level of the world of... Um, thought really or thought and emotion so that's a more inner level to sensation and to what is perceivable to the senses 
Although, again, Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff says that the case of body can be, like somebody with it can manifest it physically. Like, again, this could be the case of body using those lower sheaths, if you like, to make a physical manifestation. Or he says that one person with the case of body can recognize another, you know. But again, I would say he's not talking about a physical, like, sight or even what we normally think of as the inner sight. You know, like, I could be looking at you and maybe see your aura, uh, but that manifests in a kind of a sight. It does have a like a color and stuff. So there is a there is a, a sensory element to that. Like this more inner, I'd say the more inner layer of the Keshe body doesn't manifest at that level. Like it's even more inner than that. Has less connection to the the sensory world. You know. So should we develop our Keshe body? Uh, the whole point of of us being here and all the other planets and all the other types of people or beings is to work towards helping his endlessness, uh, you know, not suffer. So if we had developed our case jam body, that's going to be doing even more work than maybe what we should be doing here to help his endlessness. Am I making sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, it makes us more able to do certain things. Like, you know, imagine a body is, can be used. Like my physical body enables me to do certain things in the physical world, gives me certain possibilities. If I haven't got legs, then I can't do certain things. You know. So this inner body gives me certain capacities, which, like you're saying, maybe a higher, a more valuable to a, a higher need, you know, or just that they, they're needed. Like it's needed for people to have second bodies, not just so that we can like survive death or some personal motivation, but that, that these capacities are needed because they serve like, you know, a higher, higher role. But also this idea that, yeah, the Keshen body makes, gives you, makes you less prone to like being dominated by the world of the flesh, like it's spoken of in the Bible. You know? So like, yeah, you're less dictated to by like what's going on in your body, your emotions and your mind in the normal, in our normal experience of that, you know? So you're not... Um, the outside world isn't influencing you as much as it would be because you're more hopefully centered to know how to work and deal with things. Yeah, I would say that with the case of your body, the, the, like you literally get access like to another layer of experience. Something becomes alive in you, a layer of awareness. You become aware of something that you weren't kind of previously aware of or, or were. Like I would say that the case of your body concerns like a greater awareness being cast onto what we call the inner world. You know, like imagine like at the moment we've got a little torch like that's, that's what we use to see our inner world. But then, you know, the case of your body would be like, yeah, full blown light coming on. So, so in one sense, it's, we're becoming more aware of what's already there, like our inner world, but obviously becoming more aware of it illuminates a lot of stuff that we weren't aware of. So it brings, you know, so it's got something in common with our normal experience of our inner world, but obviously with the Keshe body, there becomes added things to, to that inner world. The inner world becomes much bigger, richer, you know, like Plato's, you know, cave analogy, you know, you come out of the, you come out of the cave to the real world. I said the real world, but the inner world, you become much more, you, your inner sense is open, don't they? Like again, in the Bible, there's this idea about like, like that your, your spiritual senses are kind of still blind or like puppies, some animals are born with their eyes closed. So it's like, yeah, we're engaged with the spiritual world, but our eyes aren't fully opened yet or those organs are still yet to develop. You mentioned earlier the diagrams and I wanted to say to people, the diagrams you were talking about, these are all in Spensky's, um, is it in search of the miraculous or the fourth flag? I think I think, it's I think both, it was actually, a, yeah. I think it was a search of miraculous, but there's probably, you know, there's probably in the other one as well, yeah. Because I did have a, a more Spensky quote. Where is it? Um, so this is from Spensky. What may be called the astral body is obtained by means of fusion, that is by means of terribly hard work and struggle, which is what you've been discussing. And he also goes on to say. People who have an astral body can communicate with one another at a distance without having recourse to ordinary physical means. And it's like, oh, telepathy. Wouldn't that be great <laughs> to have? <laughs> but well, we could use our yeah. Christian body. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, theoretically, it would be great to have telepathy, but it might, it might uh, bring problems as well because, you know, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be more exposed, you could say, to what's going on in people's minds or just that, you know that layer of things so yeah it might be good in one way but not good in another but yeah there could be again i would say that the case of your body it can manifest in lots of different ways like i said maybe with astral projection and some out even what's happening in some outer body experiences you know these could all be partial 
um, manifestations or access to like the Kesdjian body or that you know that um, that world. But like they may not, they might not be equivalent to the full, you know, the full manifestation of it, or the full growth of it, or what, you know, the full potential that it has. I was going to just add that from Knott, um, Knott, I forgot Knott's first name, C.S. Knott, isn't it? Anyway, yeah, he says the normal life of the Kesjan body is a passion for understanding of the mental body, the power to understand. So it is to develop your, like what you're saying, to develop your place jam body once you you want to use it, well, to understand, to be more centred and understanding and using your wisdom and your knowledge. Um, it's, a, it's a higher form of being, isn't it? Yeah. Well, like when they tend to talk about it being like formed from some kind of fusion, a lot of the time they talk about some process of like friction, you know, like it's formed from, again, alchemy, like some heat has to be involved or some kind of friction. And I suppose like in Beelzebub's Tales, Gurdjieff talks about this kind of like second body having non-desires and the physical body having desires. So you could just simplify that and imagine it in terms of like electrical charges. The, nat the, the nature of the desires of the Kesdjian body, let's say, are like positively charged. And the desires, the nature of the desires of the physical body are negatively charged. So that creates a, you know... Uh, you could say a an interaction, doesn't it? A field, and there could be, you know, there could be <laughs> various flux in that field of like, you know, one dominating the other. So when they say that the, the Kesdjian body is developed by like an inner friction and fusion, it's like yeah, the interaction of those two parts of our nature. Again, it's like we we all have some material of the Kesdjian body to begin with. We have to have gold to make gold, so we've got a, some part of us already that's of that nature or at that level, and that needs to be brought into relation with the my physical nature you know so it's like most of these different ways start by like you're trying to like develop some sort of point of awareness you know like that, that observes your mind then or your, your feelings in your body and you're like trying to bring that point of awareness which you hope is kind of of a higher nature into relation with what you're observing and you hope that, that that's like what can create a kind of a you know transformation so i would say with the this process involves you kind of tapping into some part of you, whichever way you want to, however you want to look at that, that is beyond the nature of your body, your feelings and your thoughts in, the, in our normal experience of it. Like, you know, something that's not of their nature. Again, in most of them, the kind of dual, non-dual traditions, they talk about like the change, the realm of change and the realm of the unchanging. So just this idea, you have to become aware of this other part of your nature that's different to, you could say your physical nature, or just like this, this general changing nature of your, you know, your mind, your thoughts, and your feelings. And if you can bring that, some, this this part of you that's of a different nature to that into relation to it, then that can, yeah, give birth to a kind of a process of transformation. And like something could be so, something could be formed between the two of them that kind of created from the two worlds. Like a third world can be created that has something of both of them about it. Or you can just imagine that the the greater connection is established between the inner and the outer worlds or like the case body and the physical body such that that inner body becomes more developed and becomes like the source of authority and that's like what i was meaning about not being dictated to by like the physical world you know so like there's a lot of ideas like esoteric ideas about like certain martyrs and things like that like who maybe went through intense suffering in the, whether during the course of their life or in their martyrdom as well and like how they were able to do that without like say maybe you know say you've got a satan he's said do you renounce god or we're going to burn you or torture you and he says no and then they put him you know through the torture and he, and he doesn't renounce and so like people can have questions about like you know how that's possible and stuff and one idea is that like again if this other side of you is developed you're not so much at the whim of like the physical nature and all that can be come with that, all the kind of physical sufferings and you know, you know just that kind of thing you know, you're not at the mercy of the physical world, you know, because you've got this access to this other part of you. Or like the, the idea with the Buddhist setting himself on fire, you know, it's like another symbol for that in essence, you know. Because I think that's also the thing that the, um, I've been reading a lot about Tibetan uh, rebirth and reincarnation, and they explain the difference between the um, rebirth and reincarnation. And most people say reincarnation is that's what's going to happen when you die you get reincarnated back well they're saying no that's rebirth um mm -hmm. if you develop yourself 
um, which I think this is what this case jam body is about, so that when you die, you can focus that you're dying, you know you're dying, you're moving on, then you can put yourself into that case jam body. And that's when you do, that's true reincarnation, because then you can uh, direct where you're going next. So if you come back to this earth, go on to the next world. But most people, when they're coming back, that's just normal rebirth. And I just wanted to add, in um, it's saying that when, when we do die, obviously they're saying if we've developed a case gen body, we can go into it. But that doesn't last forever. It's called the Ishmetch process. So it says when they reach this state of the sacred Ishmetch, and the reason of their highest part is already perfected up to the required gradation of the sacred measure of reason, then in the first place, the process of the sacred Raskuanu may also proceed with them, which I think is what Gurdjieff's saying, that you can choose where you go if you have developed your case jam body. But yeah, only well, by their own wish. And secondly, their highest being body is taken directly to the Holy Planet Purgatory, which is what you were telling us about. Yeah, well, it's like, like we were saying, like different, there could be different afterlife fates depending on if you've got a case of body or not and what state of development it's in. So like, yeah, different possibilities might be open to you. Let's say if, depending whether this um, body is there or what level of transformation it has. So yeah, so it might manifest, you know, that potential might manifest in some cases by like a possibility of a choice to physically kind of reincarnate. And like Gurdjieff does mention some, a, a few different possibilities. Like he doesn't, he says some case of body can be kind of come like attached to the Kesdian body of another person who's still physically incarnated. So it, it's not that they become, in that instance, it's not that they become that person, but they become connected to them, attached to them in some way. And they, and they um, you know, become into a relationship. You know? So yeah, there's probably quite a lot of, a lot of different possibilities there, you know, that um, in terms of reincarnation or different forms of that, you know, like we, I think we, we mentioned it again in one of our other talks, like it might even be possible for one Christian body to kind of partially manifest in multiple people, you know, or like manif have a connection to multiple people's Christian body, or again, its seed, you know, our inner world. But all I was going to say is, yeah, I would say that that, that Christian body, obviously, yeah, that'll have a difference on our experience of death, the moment of death. And the general idea is that, yeah, if you've got that Christian body, then your inner world, like we were talking about, has become, you've become more aware of it. It's become more kind of concrete. You've gained more access and awareness of the inner, the inner realm, which is like this equated to the spirit realm, the same, you know, realm that you're going to be going when you drop the body. It's like your inner world, what you have, you, you know, your realm of dreams and thoughts and stuff, and also like emotions and some sensations. That is where you're going to be going <laughs> when you go to the next world. You're just going to be dropping the, the layer of um, physical sensory experience so you're already experiencing partly the afterlife you have a partial access or awareness of that realm the spirit realm but if you can develop some more awareness of that realm in yourself you know and gain a greater presence of that then that's like this body and so when you go to the <laughs> there you could have more awareness more capabilities you know like they say most people enter that realm in a state of like equivalent to dream like again most people's dreams I would say on average, they're, not, they're at a low level of awareness so that the people aren't really very aware of their dreams in terms of the intensity of the experiences, like the vitality, the vividity of the experiences at a low level. There's a low level of light in most people's dreams. And obviously most people don't have much of awareness that they are dreaming. So there's very little of a lucid element to the dreaming. Um, and again, another aspect that if there's no lucid lucidity there's no like intentionality so most of the dreams what happens is just random and people can feel themselves at the mercy of it and that's why people can have nightmares because they can feel completely out of control and at the mercy of whatever's going on in the inner world they don't have much of an actual awareness that they can they can have some intentional you know control of their you know their dream world which is like you know, what lucid dream is supposed to be about I suppose. so yeah just this idea that most people enter the de enter the, the realm of the dead in like a state akin to dreaming at its normal low level, which so in which case they're going to be like disordered, not, you know, not maybe not know that they're dead. And again, that's a classic thing about souls not knowing that they're dead or like the idea with Halloween that we're supposed to like at certain times of the year, 
leave food out for the, the, the dead who are lost souls, you know, the people who've died, who've not been able to like develop their second body, you know. So we like the physical people, we, you know, who are incarnated, we do have some responsibility towards the dead. Again, reciprocal maintenance, but we can actually um, help the dead. And also in terms of, we mentioned about the different laws, like in the physical world and in the afterlife world, like space and time is different. So in terms of time, again, so the notion goes, it doesn't really matter if somebody's dead like 10 years ago, you know, or five minutes ago, that you, that you're, you can still have a, you know, that maybe your prayers for the dead can still have a, a result. It doesn't, it's not time dependent in our normal physical conception of time. Because you know? we talked about prayers in a previous show and how important they are, but just to quickly bring up back, because you brought up time, is the case joint body aware of time, do you think? It has like, yeah, you, not only like, can you get access to different, like, again, we were talking about astral travel or what's the other one? Projection. Is it astral protect? What do they call it? Astral protection? Astral projection, yeah. Like mirror, remote viewing. Like, so there's a few different capacities that are like, you know, that are, that, um, that are connected to the, to the case gym body. You know, so like I would say they are probably capacities that it can have or that it can engage but then again they may they might not be um you know they might not be say necessary maybe they're only you know meant to be used in certain cases of if, per, if a particular person has a talent that way what do you since you brought up remote viewing i've always been intrigued by it what body do you think they're using when they're doing the remote viewing well i would say it was either it's either the you call it the kesian body or the kesian body i would say using like you know, one of the other layers, like the etheric layer or something like that. Wow. But I would say that, so that the Kesha body can give us different possibilities in like physical space, like a different kind of physical travel. But yeah, it also changes our experience to time. So like, again, so people, people talk about like having experiences of what you could call time travel, like experiences of like waking up yesterday or waking up a day in the head and then like having weird you know, like Groundhog Day things, stuff like that, or just even the level of like prophecy and clairvoyance. Like, you know, you can, you know, you you've probably had experiences yourself where you can, you can either have an insight, have an yeah. insight into that something's going to happen, or maybe dream it or whatever, and it does happen. You know, and and <laughs> consistently and regularly. In which case, it suggests that there's a different order of, you could say, time to that inner world. You know. Like, well, there's a, time there's a different... all going on at the same time. It's all time happening at the same time. Because the reason I asked that question was I've read quite a lot of biographies on remote viewing. And some people say it's not astral travelling. And I'm thinking, when I read about it, it's like, but this sounds just like astral travelling. But then astral well, travelling, no, there is no time, is there? Because everything's happening at the same time. But when well, I spoke to people that astral travel when I was learning about it, they say they're not astral traveling into the past or the future. They're astral traveling in the present. You know, perhaps they go yeah. to the moon or something. Yeah. They, they, like, like, they, like we say, we, there could be different levels of this. Like remote viewing is generally you're accessing a perception of the physical world. You're just getting an insight into what's going on somewhere else in the physical world. So that you're only interacting with the physical world in terms of content with um, that one. But with astral travel, you can be you can be maybe doing the same thing like flying over london or whatever or something like that but you could also be accessing the other astral realms so you could be going to other realms that are of the physical realm and interacting with other beings mm -hmm. you know so that's a different that's another layer of it isn't it it's i mean it's out of you could say out of the body in terms of it's out of the physical world but it's not just like that level of being able to like float around the physical world or having a different kind of spatial connection to it you know I but I would say there is, I was just going to say there is, I was just going to say there is time in the astral or spirit realm. It's just like a different, like a different order of time almost. Like that's why you can have like experiences of clairvoyance and know what's going to happen like in the physical world, how you can have an insight into that. Because you could say then, yeah, okay, then in the astral realm, maybe that, ev the, that event has already happened or that just that the event has a different sequence. So there can still be time, but just a different like, kind of time okay i find this interesting because for me at the moment i'm uh, i used to read dolores cannon years ago but i've started watching her on youtube a lot 
and hadn't really understood how she got in touch with Nostradamus. Because I don't know if you know, she wrote books about her talking to Nostradamus. Uh I have no bits of it, but not much, yeah, no details. Yeah, and I found out, you know, how it was all done. It was like one of the people she was hypnotising turned out to be one of the teacher, uh, one of the students of Nostradamus. So she did past life regression, draw a canon on this woman who turned out to be a man, student of Nostradamus. But Nostradamus knew somehow, probably because he's a great magician, um, that uh, his student was having some kind of interaction with somebody else. So he said, I want to talk to the person that's coming through. And that's how he got to talk to Dolores Cannon. And he was saying, well, all time's happening at once, you know, even though I'm here back in the whatever it is. And she was, she's back in the 1990s, I think it was. Um, yeah. And that's why she, he helped her uh, understand his quatrains. And now there's all this talk of, this is why some of his quatrains haven't come true because because she's interacted with him and, and explained what these quatrains mean, people were able to stop the ones that were going to happen after her. So I find that all quite interesting that if time's all happening at once, we could still manipulate it. Yeah, well, again, there's like, like saying there's, there's these different levels, mm. you know, or these different worlds. And like you could say, each world has its own different kind of like time and space. So, and like you say, there's interaction between those levels. So, yeah, that's why there's always from, from, from the physically orientated perspective, there's always issues with like prophecy and stuff like that. Like issues, like a lot of the, the like the supposed masters who make prophecies, they like very, never come true. But that, that's only <laughs> that's only to the physically like orientated eyes. You see what I mean? And you could say that again, there can be other reasons why that they cannot come true because yeah, there can be like interaction going on between uh, the different levels. I mean, that's an old one. Gnostics say that again that the incarnation of Christ, that moment was, is the start of time. So then it, you know, that's like time starts at this point and then the past is, you know, being created and the future at the same time, they're both emerging from that center point, you know, and there's the idea that the, the Christ is um, interacting in history. So he's, it's changing like the past and the future aren't set in stone. They're changing. Like again, Al Spensky had that idea. And this is why we had the Mandela effect. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but just I'm just saying that there is there's always issues like with the interaction of those different um, realms, like say in the realm of the spirit and the realm of like prophecy and stuff and the physical world. So like and Gurdjieff's thing isn't that there's always tensions between the worlds and they're never like completely reconciled. Or just the idea that if you don't have a suitable kind of means of access to that other world, then yeah, they're always gonna it's always gonna appear like contradictory to you. Or like I say, those prophecies and stuff is never gonna appear to make maybe sense to you. Or it's going to seem contradictory because you don't have the, you know, the kind of access to that level or of that language almost. You know what I mean? Like the, the level, the, the the kind of world you could say that the, those prophets and stuff are talking about might not be the like the physical world, really. You know, so they might be talking kind of of a different events in a different world. In which case, and if we're just talk, if we're just thinking about that as like you know, it's like the classic idea with the Christ. They thought he was going to turn up in the physical like another physical body and stuff. You know? But he's not. He's going to be in a different well, body. <laughs> well, I, like we were saying, it's probably more like, you know, it's a, a, a change on mass, like a change of epoch, you know, a change yeah. of, in like the overall evolution of humanity. He's going to come out through all of us that are hopefully tuning into his um, wavelength. Yeah. And again, I would say the case of your body is probably the primary, you know, like means of, connect, of your connection to that. That's where that, that, that connection can come through, you know. So we need and that's people like, to start developing our Christian bodies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And like I would say that for me, it's primarily more related to like an inner body in the sense of a, a body of experience, you know, a body of awareness rather than inner body in the sense of like something that's just like at the level of subtle and somatic sensation, a finer kind of, you know. I'd say it's, it can have connections to that or can manifest at the level of like the etheric level and sensations and emotions but i'd say it's more at the level of you would say mind or just like what we were talking about the inner realm which can include dreaming and also like the afterlife so i would say it's more like a vehicle for higher experiences or experiences of the inner world well i've seen what the time is so i'm going to call it to a close so i'd like to thank you that was really good it was a real good dialogue in fact i didn't realize what the time was so oh yeah, i dread to i, I dread to think 
I dread to think. I dread to think what the time is. I'll tell you when we when we stop recording. But thank you, everyone. <laughs> okay. So, people, if you're interested in more of Joshua's work, is the tapestry of. I always get this wrong. But Beelzebub? just be, just that, the tapestry of uh, Beelzebub's tales. Yeah. I right. change, that, it's, it's only the Facebook. It's only the Facebook one that has the bezel hub's tales. The funny name. Right. Okay. So you can find Josh on Facebook or go straight to his website. And I'm debbie-elliot.co.uk. So thank you, everybody, for listening. And until next time, Josh, thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Yeah, good to see you. Thank you. I should press the stop.